Welcome. Here we are again. On behalf of the ICD team, welcome to our ICD Research Days webinar series and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Judy Favolden, Executive Director of the Transportation Research Institute at the University of Toronto and your host for the ICD webinar series. First, just a couple of housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded, as are all the ICD sessions in this series, and the recordings will be shared. I will, we will have Q&A following each of the talks. Chat has been disabled. So please use the Q&A to post your questions and please post questions. ICD Urban Informatics for Sustainable Metropolitan Growth is, uh, pardon me, is uh, headed by Pr Principal Investigator Professor Eric Miller and I am the Project Manager. Um, it's a highly interdisciplinary collaboration among researchers at three universities, the University of Toronto, OCAD University and the University of Waterloo. We're grateful for the support of our public sector partners, Waterfront Toronto, Transportation Services at the City of Toronto and the Region of Waterloo. And also very proud of our support at, from Esri Canada, IBM Canada and Cellent. ICD is funded by the Ontario Research Fund, Research Excellence Round 7, and we're also grateful for IRF support for our unique project. We could not have done it without all of the support both financial and in many forms of co-creating and collaborating. Over its five years of collaborations, ICITY has involved 108 researchers working on nine projects organized in three themes and produced 94 publications and counting. As I mentioned, we're organized in three themes. Theme one provides a foundation of ontologies and platforms, the subject of last Monday's talks. Theme two comprises a set of urban transportation applications in street design, parking, transit, transit-oriented design, and integrated transportation and land use planning. These applications, three of which we'll see today, are activated by visualization and decision support, which are tools created by our fine partners at OCAD University under theme three. This is the third of a series of presentations. I hope you'll join us for the others in this series. You'll find details of them and can register on the UTree website. As I said, theme two comprises a set of urban transportation applications. In today's session, Foundations for Planning and Operations, we will have three talks of 30 minutes each. Next Monday, we'll have four more talks on theme two applications. Our first talk today is Geosemantics Exchange, Connecting Content and Providing Context. And our speakers are Tazos Dardas, Hassan Bayanuni, and Megan Katsumi. I'll only briefly introduce the speakers, but you can find out more about them in the information on the series posted on the ICD website. Dr. Hassan Bayanini joined the ICD team as a postdoctoral fellow of the ICD IT SOS project after 13 years of experience in the ICT industry, where he led mega projects in the ICT infrastructure and smart cities domains. As ICD has been winding down, Hassan has been engaging with new initiatives at the Smart Freight Center, taking a leadership role in developing the freight data warehouse and data analytics solutions. Dr. Megan Katsumi joined the ICD team after completing her PhD with the Semantic Technologies Group at the University of Toronto. Megan's research is concerned with the development of a set of ontologies and reasoning services to support city services, including transportation and water. Megan has been with the ICD project since its inception, creating a foundation that unified our projects across data. Dr. Anastasios Dardas, Tazos, is a higher education developer analyst in the education research group with our partner, Esri Canada. Before he joined Esri Canada, Tazos worked with Hassan as a team co-lead in the ITS West project. At Esri, he conducts research on semantic technologies and develops applications within the ArcGIS ecosystem. Over to you, Tazos. I'm going to pass the screen to you and we look forward to hearing your talk. So oh, as uh, Judy mentioned, so we are going to be presenting the Geosemantics Exchange, or known as the GSX, Connecting Content and Providing Context. So this is like a joint collaboration between University of Toronto, uh, which is uh, by Dr. Megan Kasumi, who specializes in the ontologies, Dr. Hassan Bayanuni, who specializes in um, smart cities in IoT infrastructure, and then with Ezra Canada with the education and research by myself um, as develop the main developer for the hybrid uh, stack GIS solution with some external extent by my colleague, Dr. Mike Lahey. Can I interrupt you for a second? Um, yeah. 
slides aren't showing. Hmm? Your slides aren't um, sharing. Oh, they're not. Oh. <laughs> How about now? Perfect. Okay, great. I didn't realize I was sharing. Thank you. Um, I'll just like quickly just go through these slides. Um, so this project, the, the GSX, the origins of it is by the GFX, uh, which is known as the Geo Foundation Exchange. Um, and it is a data repository system created by Esri Canada, uh, maintained by the Community Maps team. And what it does is it reaches out to organizations and communities uh, and grabs and acquires their, their data in all different data schemas. And what the GFX does is it consolidates into one uh, data schema automatically. Now, the whole purpose of the GFX is, is that it updates on a daily basis for the use of the vector base map in which communities can use it for their own purposes. And then um, for, to a greater extent, uh, Ezra Canada uh, uses the GFX as a supplement for the next generation 911 in which emergency responders can use that real time information uh, to get from point A to point B in a time fashion and also to pinpoint the exact location of the person who needs um, who needs uh, emergency, who needs help. And the GFX comprises of 35 data sets of which we're gonna use in our use case, road segments, neighborhoods, land use types, and land cover. While the GFX does a fantastic job updating uh, the data schema on a daily basis, just like other data repository systems out there, what it struggles is that there's a huge disconnect amongst geospatial data sets. And that is not just only in the data world, but that's also in the GIS ecosystem. So let's say for instance, you, are doing, you have a study area in Toronto and you have all these data sets, road segments, land use, neighborhoods, and you can see it uh, virtually speaking on the map, the data, but they don't communicate with each other. Surely you can use uh, standard GIS software such as ArcGIS to perform, uh, uh, to perform geospatial processes and queries to make them kind of interconnected with, the, with one another. But because we're living in the data age of which we are collecting more than two and a half exabytes or that's two and a half million terabytes of data, this can be very difficult and time consuming to perform. And on top of that, this is pretty much error prone. This is pretty much error prone if it's done manually. Furthermore, uh, again, because we're in the data age, we are also grabbing external data sources of which we can definitely miss a lot of missed opportunities to combine with the current uh, geospatial data that are located in the data set silos. So this is where we actually start to come in. And our vision is to use ontologies to enable a smarter community of which Megan will discuss a little bit later, what is an ontology and its practicalities. Um, in our uh, use case, we're using the shortest path from point A to point B, which is the content. And then along that path, we're going to show you how are these data sets are automatically connected and to give that information what is along that path. And my colleague Hassan will mention a little in the next slide about uh, the, 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 the use case. But overall speaking, by integrating data as more than the sum of its own parts, we are definitely translating it into actual knowledge. Thanks, Dasos. Now let's move from theory to a real use case. Uh, we can think about it. Um, now, if we are doing the routing between point A and point B, def definitely the routing engine will choose the shortest path if it has been selected. What if we need to extract more information along of that path? For example, we will look for neighborhood, we will look for land use, point of interest, and others. Now, as we can see, there is different data sets should be integrated with the routing engine. And this one would lead for another question, which we can ask about it in the next slide, where we can look for a simple algorithm, how we need to build this algorithm. This is the, 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 the simple algorithm that we thought about it in very high level. We don't need to deep dive right now. Now we will select the origin and destination, which is point A and point B. The road network, out of the road network, if we choose the shortest path, that is a specific road segment will be selected by default by the routing engine. Now, what if we need to extract more information from different data sets that we do have? 
Now, for, to make it very simple, as we mentioned in the previous slide as a simple example, let's choose only four different data sets, neighborhood, land use, and land cover, and point of interest. This will lead for next slide, actually. The next question uh, we will face immediately that we do have different five data sets. That is data set silos and how we can build the logic, how we can connect automatically those different data sets in an automated manner, how we can extract this information because the road segments definitely the, uh, not connected to the neighborhood, even to the land use, even to the point of interest. This is, this is the, the this is the major thing that we would like to face, uh, sorry, to, to, to solve by using the ontology during the ex execution. And th this is what exactly Megan, she will explain in the next slide. And I will give the mic to Megan. Right, thanks Hassan. So Tassos mentioned earlier that it's our part of our objective, our vision to use ontologies to address these challenges. Um, but before discussing any of that further, it's important to address the question, okay, so what's an ontology? Um, just really, really high level answer here. Uh, so when we're talking about an ontology in the context of this project, we're talking about um, something in the computer science context. We're talking about a machine interpretable artifact that formally defines the semantics of a collection of concepts that are associated with the domain of interest. So in this particular use case, we're talking about something that's gonna formally define the semantics of concepts like a route, like road segments, like neighborhoods and so on. And uh, what's unique about ontologies is that it specifies these definitions in a formal way um, where we have inference procedures and tools that can support their applications. So these ontologies can actually be used for applications like automated reasoning, data validation, and semantic integration. And that's what's really critical for this project, um, where the idea is that we're using an ontology to really create a common language that can be then applied to integrate data sources um, into kind of a single description of the domain. So using an ontology, uh, we can address the case study that we saw earlier um, presented by Hassan and really explicitly identify the connections between the concepts in the domain. So the, the three kind of connections that were missing that Hassan highlighted before um, are we didn't have a relationship between the neighborhoods and the road segments. And we didn't have a relationship between the land use types and the classifications and the road segments. What we do with non-ontology is we introduce a vocabulary that we can use to explicitly describe all of these relationships. So just in this excerpt here, you can see we're introducing something called a feature, which is really, you know, any object on the map. And we can say, okay, a neighborhood is a type of feature. Uh, and we can say that, um, you know, a feature can have some associated land use, can have some associated land cover. Um, and we can also talk then about road segments and then how they might intersect features or be near features. And with this kind of definition, we can then explicitly identify the concepts in the GFX and use these connections to actually provide context with the content um, that we're looking at. So great. So uh, while Hassan has mentioned, has discussed about the use case in depth and Megan, the theoretical application, let's actually show the demonstration of how it's done. So here we have for the city of Toronto, its boundaries. Uh, this is a video recording just for the sake of time. We can link to the back to the sites. This can tell you um, what's the GFSX about and how to use this app properly. And there also will be like a follow like uh, actual video instructions how to do this. Uh, first things first is we go in, uh, we put, select an origin and then we select a destination and what we'll do is give you a warning message telling you that the, while the shortest route is instantly displayed on the map, uh, generating the knowledge graph can take a little bit of time, um, but I'll just let that go. And because we did edit this uh, video, it just shows it rapidly on the screen. And pretty soon you're gonna see that knowledge graph, which just happened right there. And it gives you an overview of how all these data sets are connected to one another along that path. So here we have neighborhood, points of interest, land use, land cover road, the total nodes that are associated, and it's their own linkages. 
the great thing about this tool is that it is interactive. So when you hover over that GeoJSON file, you see that it um, automatically increases the node size of that particular route, and then it shows the linkages associated to it. So if, if I were going back and repeat it one more time, um, here we can say that this particular node, which is here, is connected, of course, to two road segments, and it's also located in High Park, uh, Swanson uh, neighborhood, and has a land cover code of 230. Um, now, it's it could be surprised. What this can tell us, aside that what is connected to what, is that this can also tell us the data integrity or the data validity. In other words, um, in this case, how is it um, that this road has only one land cover code of 230? It could be that it could indicate that there could be some more missing data. Um, it, it, it just raises the, the question of the data quality. And that's how the ontology, is, especially this knowledge graph, automatically can show us here. And as we keep going, um, you can, it's, it's very interactive. It shows you what is connected to what, points of interest, everything. And then you can go right along that route. And this works within the city of Toronto uh, only, because that's where we have the network data set uh, uh, for, that, for that region. So how do we make this uh, a reality? Is that first, uh, I'm presenting the GSX architecture, is we host it in a, in a Microsoft Azure virtual machine. Uh, we automatically grab the GFX uh, and spit it right into the PostgreSQL via Enterprise Geo database, of which then on top uh, does the, the automatically the field mappings and then feeds it right back into the ArcGIS Enterprise, which is like the workhorse of performing uh, uh, GIS analytics uh, and, web, and web GIS applications. Um, and in this case, we are, we are updating that network data set. And then we use Flask, which is a, a Python backend um, that does these processes, generating that knowledge graph, and then shoots it back to the front end, uh, which is the standard HTML and JavaScript code of which only the client can see and, and, and interact with. Uh, standard uh, APIs, the, the, the most notable APIs that we've used is, so to generate the knowledge graph, um, we did already two in RDF lib packages. Uh, D3JS does the aesthetics of it. Uh, doing some simple geospatial uh, processes in the back end, we use our ArcPy, ArcGIS API for Python. And then on top of that, it's like just to refine a little bit the data structures with NumPy and Pandas. And then the rest of the, the application, which is like the workhorse of the, the front end, and even to certain extent calculating that shortest route, is the ArcGIS JavaScript API. Okay, so I'm just going to elaborate a little bit more on the ontology part of the solution here. Um, so really the role of the ontology in this application, as I mentioned, is to provide a representation for the relevant data layers. So here you can see an illustration of the GSX ontology that was developed to support this project. Um, so we can see on the screen that we have classes defined to capture relevant concepts as well as different attributes and um, properties that relate the different classes. And this allows us to um, explicitly capture the relationship between the different la data layers. And then as Tassos mentioned, we're using automated tools to map the data from the, its raw format in GFX into an ontology-based representation where these relationships are explicit. From this point, we have essentially a knowledge graph um, that we can then use in the application to query whichever sort of data points are required. So that makes it really flexible. It can support the application that Tassos just pre presented. It can easily be extended to capture other sorts of data sets um, or you know, to query information in other ways as is required um, for that visualization. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, um, I just want to sort of highlight here that the GFX ontology that we used in this project is a direct extension of other work that we've done in the iCity project. So the GSX ontology extends the concepts and the ontologies that were defined in the iCity ontology, which was presented in one of the sessions earlier this week. In the iCity ontology, uh, we have lots of different 
um, sort of modules that describe different aspects of the city domain. So we have ontologies that look at foundational concepts like location, time, and so on. We have ontologies that describe city level concepts like buildings and households and, and things like that. Um, and these are all defined at more or less a generic level. So what we've done here is then extend the relevant concepts to capture these definitions specific to the GFX specification and then apply that ontology uh, in the case study. So it's also important to note that the IC ontology is serving as key input for a series of ISO IEC standards um, on city data. So uh, I think it's there should be a lot of uh, increased opportunities to build on this work in the future. Now we are reaching the dot next station, I would say. Um, what, is the, what are the future work that can be done? Definitely there is a lot we can think about. Uh, first of all, we are planning it, or we are thinking about the efficiency and functionality of the prototype that has been just presented by TASOS, how we can enhance and improve the efficiency, efficiencies and adding more functionalities to the prototype. Um, the second pillar actually we are thinking about is how we can integrate an external data, for example, Toronto Open Data, how it can be integrated using the ontology. This is the main uh, thing that we are focusing on. And it can be beyond that because now we are focusing on Toronto area, but we can think beyond, on, for example, GTA area. Uh, also, how we can apply this prototype for other uh, uh, real use cases that has been developed by ISRI and others how we can inherit that same um, concept that has been developed during the, the prototype. Uh, the last pillar, um, how we can infuse and uh, incorporate the ISO standardization that uh, just Megan, she spoke about uh, to be part of the solution architect that has been built already. Now we are moving to the, our last uh, slide during this. This is our destination where that's, this is the last slide. Many thanks for ICT Ontario Research Fund uh, and University of Toronto, University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute and definitely for our partner ISRI Canada for uh, creating this environment, providing the facilitation and cooperation between different entities to come with this prototype. Uh, thanks again, and I would like to invite uh, Mr. Michael from ISRI Canada to join us during the Q&A session. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't have a whole lot to add to this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you guys in the driver's seat unless uh, someone really wants to hear from me. Uh, welcome, Michael. I don't know. They wanted you there. That's okay. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome, Michael uh, Lee, also of Esri Canada. We'll get to speak more with Michael later, and he may be piping up at this moment. Thank you, Megan Tassos and Hassan. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, um, and uh, I'm going to go back to your next steps for uh, other opportunities for this work. Um, I know this is very much the foundational level of it, and the ISO standard hopefully progressing well. Um, can you describe how we can use this approach in context outside of the GFX, other applications or other bits of data? I, I could like answer some of this and then uh, Megan, Hassan and uh, Mike, if you want anything to add on. Um, another uh, real use application, and I did mention this earlier, um, way back in the, I think, first hand uh, set of slides is about the next generation, 911. Um, and what what briefly that is about is is pretty much like improving the the telecommunications and pinpointing the exact location of where the person is that needs uh, help uh, from uh, emergency responders and where how does this um, application could potentially can come into play is um, is that we are we would implement um, real data and and that you know since we have that use case from point A to point B already for the shortest route we can automatically take that real time data in the city let's say construction or detours are happening along that path and automatically just change that network that network along the way because that gives us like that supplement information rather than just doing like a standard from point A to point B based on like shortest time or shortest uh, uh, distance from like previous uh, calculations that have been done. So with this that we, you know, the, the, the data sets of which the ontologies have um, 
it uh, it's it's designed to add uh you know, to update any data attributes, and then we can use that to update then the routing um, for for the next gen nine one one. So I, I don't know if Megan Hassan or Mike, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, um, I'll just add just add a, a kind of a brief comment. So I think that that was I mean that was a great answer, and uh, that's a great example of a specific application. But just to add. Um, that something that I think is that is sort of uh, unique or uh, really great about this work is that um, the project on its own is, you know, we showed an illustration of a particular use case um, where it can be applied, but the general architecture that we came up with and a lot of the work that um, especially Tassos did in um, on the Esri side of figuring out how all these pieces can connect is really uh, general to a large extent. So I think it's really almost wide open what other applications there could be in kind of doing this, applying this same approach for a number of different data sets. Can I, can I, uh... Just hop in and, and ask, ask the same question with a bit of a twist on it. Um, uh, I think I, somebody mentioned open data. So, for example, City of Toronto, many other cities have posted open data. And um, let's imagine there are people out there who would like to be able to use this open data to answer questions. And that data, like I'm guessing, um, like data that you found before you built this ontology on the GFX, is in different places, collections of data on the same website, but not actually connected. Um, how, we've got a lot of expertise um, on our screen right now, four doctors. How much expertise does it take to do this? And uh, what, would it, what would it take to enable um, uh, a person going to an open data uh, website to be able to use an ontology to uh, link up data and answer more interesting questions? Um, yeah, I guess, so that's probably, for me, that question. Um, I, I think um, it, it would be not a, a small amount of work, and the main challenge for that, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, we've taken a first step, which is important, which is in developing an ontology that we think does a good job of kind of capturing the domain. Um, but the next step is actually would actually be to go through a lot of those data sets. So to a certain extent, the mappings can be uh, generalized once you sort of know what the data is that you're looking at. Um, but as I'm sure a lot of people who have looked at that data may know, is you there's a, still a gap in a lot of cases in a kind of understanding what is in that data. Um, and, when, and that's something that actually has to be encoded in the mappings in, in order to really um, capture it properly. So, you know, this column says ID, well, what, what is it the ID of? So in some cases, the metadata is there, in some cases it's not. So that's kind of a gap that exists that would need to be addressed. Um, but we're, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly but surely. <laughs> bit by bit by bit. So when we talk about uh, big data and, uh, and smart city and smart city in the sense of the data and technology applications, not in, not in the many other ways the city wants to be smart, um, we'd have a ways to go to be um, actually leveraging up big data in a, in a cogent and consistent way and running any kinds of really smart applications. I, I think that's safe to say. Yeah, I would, I would say so, so as well. Um, I mean, this is just like a work in progress. And I think eventually we are going to get there where we really translate theory into practice. This is just like the start of the road here, mm -hmm. the, what we're presenting. Uh, I think that the good starting point, if we are able to define the use case, then we can start connecting the different data silos that we do have. Then step by step we leave we will will reach a level of maturity of connecting data connected data actually and maybe it feeds back into uh, information we need about uh, what kind of data to collect uh, absolutely we are it, moving from right? data era to information era absolutely yeah yeah lots 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 and lots of data and uh, you know it's time and, and and it's time that we started using it so uh, that's why this party was up this project it was a party I uh, said so informatics uh, was about using data, uh, evidence-based decision-making, uh, support for decision-making based on 
data and analytics, uh, which is our expertise. So great job, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael is going to stick around. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And I want to remind you um, that this is one of the talks and one of the bits of work done on the, our work on ontologies for urban modeling and design. And you can find out more about this research on the brand new ICD website. I encourage you to go to this website to find out more about the people, the locations, and presentations. There's a lot of support. ICD.toronto.ca. All right. Welcome back, Michael. And welcome, Eric Miller. So our second presentation, ArcGIS Visualization of Origin Destination Model Inputs, also features a collaboration between ICD researchers and our excellent partners at Esri Canada. We just met Michael in the last Q&A. Dr. Michael Leahy is also a higher education developer and analyst in the Education Research Group at Esri Canada. He manages the Esri Canada GIS Centers of Excellence program and contributes to a variety of research and development projects using Esri technologies in collaboration with researchers at universities and colleges across Canada. Professor Eric Miller is UT's director. He also leads the data management group, the keepers of the data from the Transportation Tomorrow Survey, and the travel modeling group, developers of the GTA model, an advanced regional travel demand modeling system used by municipalities in the greater Toronto area to forecast travel demand. This talk is about addressing the challenges of creating visualizations with OD flows based on TTS data to provide insight into transportation demand patterns and those models. Over to you, Michael. Um, so what I'm going to present uh, in my slides here is work that we've been doing in the education and research group at Esri Canada to customize the ArcGIS platform to um, innovate ways to visualize origin destination model outputs. Um, and what inspires this is work that's being done by the, the U-Tree Travel Modeling Group. Uh, so before I go into uh, what I want to show here, um, Eric, I don't know if you'd like to give a little bit of background on, on what uh, your group's been doing. Yeah, well, so uh, yeah, our group does, uh, does build travel demand models that, that are used in the region. Uh, I think the starting point for this project is was our recognition based on their experience that travel demand is, is very difficult to analyze because of its high dimensionality. Uh, you know, every trip is a movement from a specific origin to a specific destination at a specific time of day for a particular purpose. Uh, and, and understanding that origin destination structure of trip making is particularly important if we are to design transportation networks and services that, that actually serve uh, effectively uh, travel markets. But these problems are very difficult to, to see uh, using conventional GIS software. Uh, so in one of my dreams, I for a long time have wanted to have improved tools for visualizing origin destination patterns in a user-friendly and analytically powerful way. And our ICD partnership with Esri Canada has actually provided us with an opportunity to, to really dig deeply into this problem. So uh, Michael has been working on this, and I'm going to turn it back over to him to, to show you show you the progress he's made in tackling what, what is a, a very non-trivial but, but really important uh, uh, a problem in, in travel demand modeling. All right. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, so. What I'm going to show here is really to uh, provide provide a little bit of context from from our perspective uh, working with GIS um, and kind of try to articulate the the challenge that we face trying in visualizing these data within uh, a GIS environment. And then I'll present a couple uh, prototypes that we've developed. One we actually uh, presented last year, and a new one that we've created since then and then uh, talk about, a little bit about opportunities for further development. Um, so where we started with was some sample data provided by uh, the Travel Modeling Group. Um, I believe these are outputs from the Integrated Land Use Transportation Environment. Um, so this is an activity-based travel demand model that uh, is based on or using Transportation Tomorrow survey data to simulate travel metrics across the, the GTA in Hamilton. Uh, so the sample data that we, we've been working with uh, include metrics for the time and cost related to taking public transit versus driving in an automobile, 
And these could be simulated under a variety of different scenarios. Uh, in this case, we've got different times of the day. And the, these data relate to uh, 2,375 zones across uh, the city. Um, and the challenge that we're trying to deal with is how to visualize uh, the, these highly dimensional data um, in an intuitive uh, mapping environment. So to, to help break it down so that uh, we understand where the challenge is, I'll first talk about how a conventional GIS uh, structures its data so that it can display it on maps. Uh, generally speaking, we, we store data in tables where each row in the table is associated with a geometry or a feature that we can show on a map. So in the table structure, that's essentially one column that stores data about the geometry. It could be a point line or polygon. In this case, we're dealing with polygon features. And then the remaining tables in that column store things like identifiers or names that we would associate with those or attributes or variables that we can um, use to characterize those features in a map display. So for a GIS, we take that information. As we draw those features on a map, we can use one or more um, attributes to characterize how they should be displayed. And this is how we produce the, the visual representations of data that reveal uh, spatial patterns of, of different types of phenomena. So in the case of the travel simulation model outputs, we get origin destination matrices. Uh, so in this data structure, what we have instead is uh, for each row in this matrix, uh, we have one column that identifies the identifier of a zone within the Tr Toronto Transportation Survey, um, representing the origin of travel. And then for each column, the first row contains an identifier representing the, the zone associated with the destination. And then the data within this uh, matrix is uh, different values that are representing essentially one metric. It could be cost, it could be time, uh, something associated with traveling to and from uh, the origins and destinations. So if we take a look at an example, um, in this case, if we were, for example, going to travel from an origin, zone three, we'd pick the values in this row and to see what the value is for going from there to zone one, our destination at the top. Uh, we would pick this value here. And the, this matrix isn't symmetrical, so if you wanted to reverse your direction, you would go from zone one back to zone three, and you choose this value here. And you can see, uh, certainly under different conditions, depending on your direction of travel, it could be the same two zones, but uh, traffic patterns or, or other um, constraints can change the values of, of your metric. So in this case, it's, uh, a uh, certain cost to go from zone three to zone one, but slightly higher to go back in the other direction. So now if we look at this from a, from a GIS perspective, uh, these zone identifiers, we can relate to the actual features represented or that those re zones represent. So we can display them on a map. What we get then is for additional attributes, whereas in GIS, those would be additional columns in a table. In this case, we need to represent them as additional matrices, one for each uh, metric. And then it, for different scenarios or different periods of time, the same metrics would also be represented in further additional matrices. So the challenge we face is how do we make these data intuitively um, uh, visualized within a, a standard GIS map display. So we're, we're kind of trying to fit uh, a square peg into a round hole, which um, is maybe not a terrible analogy because uh, with a bit of creativity, we can certainly find ways to work around a problem like this. And so that's what I want to show here, the, the, what we've done to, to make this work. So if we go back to this, uh, uh, origin destination matrix, uh, and we look at it from a conventional GIS perspective, we can still look at the columns as attributes. So if we do that, what we're saying is uh, we're showing the metric for travel to a specific destination. That's the, the feature represented by the identifier in this column from all possible origins. So that would be the rows with a feature, different feature for each row. 
we can take this and we can apply it to our, our map where we've chosen our zone and we can apply the values from this column to all the surrounding zones, which represents the, the metric we're using to travel or, or simulate the travel to this particular zone. So in this case, this would be uh, travel time or travel cost associated with this traveling to the, this selected zone where the, the brighter values essentially represent better values. So either uh, fast, lower times or, or lower costs. To go in the other direction, we can transpose our perspective on this table and um, treat a row as if it were an attribute column in a GIS table. So what we're doing is showing all of the um, metrics for travel to all possible destinations represented by the columns or the features with each column from a specified origin. That's the one feature associated with this row. So it's the same principle, but instead we're traveling out from our selected zone and these values are being assigned to the corresponding features uh, related to each column. So we've done this in ArcGIS Pro. We presented this last year. My colleagues, Michael Lubert and Dr. Hossein Hosseini uh, developed an add-in for ArcGIS Pro, uh, the, the desktop software by Esri. And they, it steps through a workflow to convert an origin destination matrix into a standard geo database table. That's a native format for ArcGIS. They added some additional um, analysis so they could calculate uh, differences between two matrices, uh, for example, to compare the cost or time to travel versus in a car versus uh, public transit. And then uh, that essentially produces another type of origin destination matrix, in this case showing differences um, based on origin and destinations. Uh, so these data can then be joined to features representing the uh, uh, trans more, uh, transportation survey zones. Uh, depending on whether you're looking at an origin or a destination, we can uh, attach that data to those features and display them in 2D or 3D visualizations. So this is a, a recording uh, showing the, the, the add-in in action. It's a prototype uh, where you can select uh, two matrices. It'll calculate the differences between those. And uh, when you select uh, a location within this data set, depending on whether it's the origin or destination, we extract a row or a column out of the, the resulting comparison matrix, apply those values to all the polygons, and then we can display the, the distribution of that pattern across the, the study area. And so the same data can be visualized in 3D. In this case, the, the polygons are being artificially extruded based on the values assigned to them. And also in this case, colorized to highlight the uh, threshold where the, the cost for taking transit is higher than uh, taking a vehicle, for example. So that, that's where we were about a year ago. Uh, the benefits of this uh, add-in is that it simplifies the integration of the o origin destination matrix into the ArcGIS environment. The data can be integrated with any other uh, standard visualization or analysis workflow in the ArcGIS software, uh, but it also uh, exposed some challenges that we faced. Uh, for example, when you pick a particular zone, um, as an origin or a destination, you're essentially viewing 0.04% of the actual data within that matrix. We're taking tiny strips out of it and using it to uh, display a pattern across space, but it's a very small fraction of what's in that matrix. And so if you want to look at more of the data with that matrix, you, we then run into performance constraints because one matrix represents uh, 2,375 columns or twice that many if you're thinking in both directions. And when, when we switch from one to the next, there's a little bit of delay when you change the renderer and change the data behind the layer that's being displayed. So it takes about one to two seconds. So at this point, what, what do we need to do? We, we need uh, fast and interactive visualization. Uh, to be able to intuitively and seamlessly explore these data. So it needs to be fast so that we can cover more of the data efficiently and interactive so that it, you, you get an intuitive experience as you, as you interact with the data to get a better understanding of how the patterns uh, change 
over uh, geographic space. So we took an alternative approach with the next prototype that's to use the, uh, a custom web app developed with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript to kind of articulate why uh, this was a beneficial approach. Uh, I'm, I'm relying on a comparison made by Douglas Crockford, a, a prominent developer in uh, JavaScript and, and web development in general. Um, and he spoke at one of our user conferences recently. Uh, so he compares Java versus JavaScript. Uh, we're not using Java, but it's very comparable to the development environment for creating an add-in for, for ArcGIS Pro. Uh, so he equates them to uh, well-known uh, science fiction universes. Uh, so Java in this case is Star Trek and JavaScript is Star Wars. Uh, so if we have some science fiction fans in the audience, uh, hopefully you'll appreciate this comparison. Um, so there's obviously similarities as with any programming language, they do a lot of this, a lot of similar things. So in Star Trek, we've got phasers versus lightsabers and blasters in Star Wars, photon torpedoes versus proton torpedoes. Uh, but from the protagonist perspective, there's some fundamental differences. So in Star Trek, you've got uniforms, regulations, uh, an organized federation of planets, time directives, lots of rules. In Star Wars, you have sand and chaos. Uh, so it's, it's a humorous comparison, but uh, it highlights for me uh, the opportunity you have within the JavaScript development environment to essentially bend and break rules to try new things. Uh, so that's uh, great for our uh, WebGIS uh, Jedi developer and uh, second rate Karate Kid impersonator. Um, where we can use this to our advantage to experiment and try a lot of new things. So what the ArcGIS API for JavaScript gives us is a well-structured framework within the JavaScript development environment for creating WebGIS applications. It uses WebGL in the latest versions for rendering both in 2D and 3D, but also provides us the ability to take over the rendering of a layer using our own custom WebGL code. And this is where we, we can essentially have our own playground. Um, now, before this, I had pretty much zero knowledge of how to work with WebGL. And I'm still, uh, I'd still say I know very little about WebGL. However, last year at our developer summit, Esri kindly presented this demo that shows a 2D custom WebGL map that's showing animated trees blowing in the wind, campfires with smoke and waves animated on a lake. And this is really what I needed to get started. It shows us how to take a polygon, draw it in a custom WebGL layer and control how it's being displayed on the map. So we took this demo, pared it down and took the part that draws polygons and overrode the part that styles them so that we could control how they look based on data from an origin destination matrix. So the way it works in our custom application is we load the origin destination matrix into memory, but we keep it separate from the zone features. We draw the PTS zone features as polygons in our WebGL layer. As the user interacts with the application, either by tracking a mouse over the, the polygons on the map or clicking on them, we can select a zone identifier uh, consult the origin destination matrix, pick a row or a column, uh, analyze it and generate a lookup table of colors that we would assign to each zone throughout the city. And then this uh, lookup table is used by the custom WebGL layer as it's drawing the polygons in each animation frame in the application. So this is our result. Um, you can visit this on GitHub. There's a demo online. And what's happening is it's loading uh, an origin destination matrix, which is a fairly significant amount of data into the application. And then you can see as you uh, track your mouse over this map, it's uh, displaying that data uh, almost as fast as you can move your mouse across the map. So you can see here, this is the distribution of uh, transit time across the city that is highly irregular due to the nature of the public transit network. And if you switch to compare that to traveling in a vehicle, you can see that you have a much more uh, uniform 
distribution of how well you can travel throughout the city in a car. Um, but you can still see even within that the effects of the transportation network itself. Now the, the demo we've created um, or the, the module we used in that demo is a reusable object with our API. So any application um, with our API, such as this app where I've created four maps, so we can reuse the same object to display uh, different data. In this case, they're all in sync. So we can interact with one map and see the, the distribution of the, the metrics across the city in, in uh, four different time periods, for example. All right, so that's where we are um, in terms of developing this prototype, but there's obviously lots of opportunity to take things uh, much further. Uh, we can look at integrating better with the, the uh, modeling systems that are producing these data so that we can more rapidly visualize them um, and understand the outputs that we're getting. Uh, we can look at more integration between the ArcGIS Pro and use its benefits in combination with the, the, the enhanced visualization we get with the custom app. Um, the underlying ArcGIS API for JavaScript that we're using is constantly being improved. So if we come back and revisit this, there may be um, updates that we can take advantage of to minimize our code and um, focus on the things that make um, this visualization um, what it is. Then, of course, we would like to com combine this with um, a more fully featured application as you interact with this map, show real-time charts and displays that give you uh, different views into the data that you're interacting with. Uh, so on that point, uh, last night, I did spend a little bit of time to take this a little bit further. I didn't add any charts or graphs, but I did want to show um, the ability to do a comparison between two matrices in this visualization. So this is showing uh, transit time versus um, driving in a car. And you can see that across the city, uh, the magenta color means it's a higher value for transit. So um, driving in a car is faster pretty much everywhere uh, in most cases, but it's a much different story when you look at cost. You can see um, where it's uh, transitions to yellow, it's actually more cost effective to drive in a car. And depending on the characteristics of the transit versus um, regular transportation networks, you can see different patterns. And this, these are the two main factors, for example, for an individual to decide whether they're going to take public transit versus driving in a car. So that's pretty much my entire story. Um, if anyone has any questions, I guess now's the chance. Or Eric, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. Um, no, I think that it's a great, great presentation. So uh, I think we just just open up for questions if anybody has questions. Uh, yes, hi. Here we are back. Thanks very much. Um, I do. There are a couple questions, uh, and I think some of this goes back. If you consider the questions of what there were about the ontology, and I think you know this is half for you, Eric, and half for you, Michael. Um, how would a couple different kinds of users? So suppose you're a suppose you're a policymaker, you have something to do with the provisioning of transportation services, whether in roads or in transit. Um, how might you make use of this? And then suppose you're a, a person in the city of Toronto wondering about service in their agent region. How how might you be enabled to use this? So it's kind of a twofold question. How do you do it? How how would it be used? And then if I want to try this at home. You mentioned GitHub, uh, a prototype. What what does a what does somebody need to have to be able to do this kind of analysis? How will it be used, and what do you need to be able to do it? Well, maybe I'll take a, a first first pass at that. Um, cer certainly, I think one of the intentions of developing this sort of capability is so that policymakers, politicians, etc., could well, particularly policy people, could play with this. And the whole idea of getting it fast and interactive is so that, let's say we were looking at uh, a subway extension, and we've done the model run, so with and without the subway extension, and maybe two or three variations on frequency, and you know, so we have a, a number of scenarios, um, <clears throat> it would be nice, it would be really good to be able to show on the map 
who benefit, you know, where are the, if we open up the subway, how do travel times change for people where and during what time of day and, and depending on where they're going? Uh, how many more people are likely to be using it coming up with a remote choice model and who are these people and where are they going to and this sort of thing? So it's, it's very hard for people in the abstract to, to uh, understand the real impacts of something like a subway extension. They assume it's going to be good for everybody. Um, but, you, you know, usually we just report, oh, it's going to save on average four minutes of travel time. Well, um, how much travel time does it save for whom? And, and, and so they able to show the origins and destinations uh, interactively and allow you to play. Well, I live here, you know, what would be the impact? Or my constituents are here, what would be the impact? Uh, so I think that's, that's uh, that to me is the more immediate one. Uh, to make this available to people at home, I think, uh, and Michael may have some views on this, I think it's a little more difficult because there is a lot of data and, and a lot of models underneath the hood that you don't necessarily have access to. Everything Michael has explained, or, or, you know, he's, he's accessing static databases that have been set up. Uh, if you want to know, you know, I, 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 what, what mode should I take to go to work today? That's not an easy question to answer uh, with, without a lot of background information and models. Yeah, and I wasn't thinking, what do I do today? But, you know, it might be, what is my informed opinion about this? Well, you know, so if I want to understand this. Yeah, so in principle, I mean, again, you could be, we could be putting these sorts of scenarios that have been run up and allow you the chance to do these sort of things and sort of see what the impacts are. I mean, I think it would be nice to be able to create, uh, to gamify this a little bit so that, uh, you know, if you wanted to, you know, propose an alternative and test it, you can see it, that's where having access to a model that would run fast to generate some new data for you would, would be a little more problematic. Michael, can uh, you, you have a prototype, what does it take to make this from, take this from prototype to product or service? Where did we leave? Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say, uh, um, the, the visualizations are provocative and interesting. Uh, shows the real value of visualization when you're looking at a large amount of data. Um, what would it take to take the prototype work we've done in this uh, research project and make it into a product that and, uh, and maybe uh, somehow accessible to people who wanted to do their own exploring? Yes, pol yes, policymakers and yes, people who are in, yeah. in, in charge of making these decisions and will have the responsibility for it, but, you know, people who, who want to have an informed opinion. Uh, well, so the visualization itself, um, for example, what I showed right now that's already available online, it's, it's hosted as a web app in, in GitHub. Um, anyone can, can access that. So, you know, for example, if there is some some policy proposals and there's some simulations that have been produced to uh, uh, measure what those might look like, then uh, this kind of application can certainly be made accessible, and anybody with a web browser uh, can show or view the uh, the, the the web app application we, we created. Um, but to to produce and visualize the the data that we put into that, that's uh, much more involved and complicated, and uh, that's the domain of the researchers that Eric and and his teams. Yeah, are yeah, the, out, the 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 outputs of those models, indeed. Um, so I will take this moment to mention uh, once again the iCity website. We have we are not yet hosting applications on the website, uh, but we will be. And so tune in sometime over the next several weeks because we will be posting applications like the one Michael's made it available on GitHub on the iCity website. So thank sure. you very much. And right. on we go. Our third talk is uh, from Ala Atani and Olafumbi Disusule. And they're going to speak to us on uh, the bus bridging assessment tool and visualization dashboard. Welcome, Ala and Fundi. I'll tell you a little bit about both of our researchers. Uh, Ala Tani is a PhD student in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering at the University of Toronto. Her research interest is in planning and modeling on-demand transit in the era of new mobility and automation. 
Ella holds an MASc from the University of Toronto, and during that time, she focused her research on developing a decision support toolkit for managing unplanned subway disruptions. Thus, we're going to hear about that today. Uh, Alifumi Dusu Sule is an undergraduate at Fanshawe College, where he's enrolled in his fourth year of environmental design and planning. He's currently a research assistant at OCAD University's Visual Analytics Lab. His research is focused on the implementation and utilization of Esri software to solve urban visualization problems, and he's been a contributor to our Theme 3 visualizations. Welcome. Um, I'm going to now pass the control of the screen over to you, Ala. Hello, everyone. Um, so today, um, I talk along with Ulfumbi from OCAD University on the bus bridging tool and visualization dashboard. Um, Actually, this presentation has main two parts. The first part is on the decision support toolkit uh, on its own, which we call DashBus, and it's actually for deployment and assessment of shuttle bus service. Um, and then Olufumbi will be talking about the visualization dashboard. Um, and I would really like to acknowledge the big research team that uh, participated in this uh, project, including myself, uh, Dr. Aya Abudina, Dr. Siva, Professor Rehab, and under the supervision of Professor Amr Shalabi from the University of Toronto, where we were um, actually responsible for the conceptualization and development of the tool. And from OCAD University, all of them be Dr. Grace and Professor Jeremy, um, they, respond, they were part of the visualization for our tool. Um, so without further ado, I would like to start with a very, um, brief background on subway disruptions in Toronto. Um, from data collected from TDC in 2015, we, we realized that there are 144 unplanned subway disruptions that required really shuttle buses to be selected from different parts of the system in order to bridge the closed um, subway. Um, uh, stations. And really, in, in that year, there's a total of 6,500 buses that were re requested uh, to really bridge the, this gap in the service. And the interesting thing is that really 70% of these requested buses were taken from existing operational routes, um, um, which means that you not only have a disrupted subway passengers, but we're all also affecting other people in different parts of the system. Um, and a very interesting uh, a number value that we, we found um, in, in large cities like um, New York, the economic cost of subway passenger delays due to major subway disruptions was estimated to be around $389 million annually. So, out of this, um, we know that these unexpected disruptions happen really frequently, and there's really some very simplistic approaches in selecting the shuttle buses from all over the place or from the system, um, which really can lead to extensive delays. As, as I mentioned, we're not only uh, affecting the subway passengers, but also other bus riders and the transit network itself, which really makes the worse than the quality of service uh, for the public. And here really comes our motivation behind um, developing a tool that could help agencies um, dispatch shuttle buses enter in case of unplanned disruptions and evaluate really different possible plans and post-incident post analysis. Uh, and this tool really needs to provide um, some metrics from the customer perspective and some other metrics from the shuttle buses, the, the, the service, um, the efficiency, the time spent on shuttle or the time really spent um, uh, on traveling just on the road. Um, and this is a very simplistic um, a kind of visualization um, of the concept behind um, the tool, where really we have um, so consecutive uh, um, number of stations that are closed and train service cannot freely continue. Um, so shuttle buses are pulled from different existing operational routes in the system. I've traveled all the way to this incident in order to serve passengers affected by the subway disruption until the disruption is over. Um, and this is really a flowchart. Um, also explaining our methodology, we, we start by tracking the shuttle buses the moment they, re they um, leave the routes and all the way until they travel, um, reach the incident and start serving the subway passengers. And then we simulate the shuttle bus service along this closed disruptive segment. Um, and we actually compute or estimate the wait times, the travel time, uh, following the deterministic queuing analysis. Um, and for this tool, we actually use it for two different use cases. Um, the first one uh, for assessing different um, 
scenarios, which we call the Dash Bus Planner, as agencies can use it to help them better planning their shuttle bus services, um, and bus in terms of unplanned sub subway disruptions. And the other one is the Dash Bus Optimizer, which we really need to help them take better decisions. Um, so for our Dash Bus Planner, um, it really takes two types of inputs. Um, the first inputs really are more kind of um, incident specific and bus bridging plan itself, which is really here the number and assignment of shuttle buses, which means really what is the number of shuttle buses that the agency would like to request? Uh, which routes are these coming from? How many buses per route? And where will these buses start their service? At which end station? And we have other bunch of data that's really connected to the transit characteristics themselves, ridership, and uh, travel time. And we really get a bunch of metrics that really can help agencies assess um, their bus bridging plan. Was it good? Was it not good? How can I improve it? Um, and really to have a simple case study, we took one of the incidents that happened in 2015 between the Blue Rung and Anglington stations. And for the people who are not very familiar with the TDC um, network, um, this section really connects the uptown and midtown to the downtown core. So during morning peak period, this is a very congested segment. Um, and if you look at these numbers in red, um, we can see here the, the delays in passenger hours due to this disruption. And we can see that uh, from Eglinton and Blue Young, we have really a high number of delays. Um, and during this time, like for this specific incident from the data that we got from TTC, we know that TTC requested 23 buses, out of which eight could not make it to the incident itself. So there's kind of a waste of time and there's a kind of inefficiency in this shuttle bus selection. So how can we really use this tool to, to have a better decision? Um, we know that on the left, um, these are the unused buses and we can see that the dead head time, which is really the time spent traveling from the existing route to the disruption itself is really high and that's kind of the reason why these services, these buses did not make it to the incident on time to contribute to the shuttle service. So what if we can really know using this tool eliminate these buses and run it so what we will get and there's really a significant reduction in the bus users delays those bus passengers that are really have nothing to do with the uh, existing uh, kind of um, closure. But what if really 23 buses are needed or even more? Let's try to dispatch these buses from uh, a closer route. Uh, and that's how this, the, how the map here on the right, on the top right, really what is showing. Um, the, the routes are really selected from closer uh, kind of uh, uh, to the incident. And we can really see an, a significant improvement in the shuttle bus performance metrics, which means the, num the buses are now spending more time serving as shuttle versus just wasting time traveling uh, on the road. And which really reflects to the user delays. We can see that subway passenger delays has a significant reduction. Um, we look at the bus riders delay, a very slight increase compared to the savings to the subway riders delays. Um, and this is because um, the closer the routes to the subway core, to the subway system and to the downtown core, the, the higher the ridership. Uh, moving on from here to our optimization um, uh, tool. Um, and now here we, instead of really feeding the tool by the assignment on the shuttle bus or bus bridging plan, we need to have a tool that can really tell agencies what is the best plan for this certain incident. Um, and basically, we are we can recommend the maximum number of the optimal number of shuttle buses, which bus routes are best to be select these buses from. How many buses from each route am I going to select one or three? Um, uh, and which end stations will this shuttle service start from? And these are the, our main out outcomes from the optimization model. Um, and this is, uh, we used um, an evolutionary algorithm. This is just an overall uh, a scheme of how did we use this uh, dash bus inside uh, the optimization model. And there's more information in our publications that I think are also on the website. Uh, about this um, optimization in specific. Um, but the interesting thing is we need to compare the outcomes of current plan versus the optimal plan. And we can see here that there's a really significant reduction in the dead head time for each bus, like an average 15 minutes of saving time for each shuttle bus that was spending on road to serve as a 
shuttle service. And if we look at the previously, like 50% of the time, these buses were almost spending just on the road versus the optimal plan, really minimizing this 10%. And most of the time is serving passengers, which increasing the efficiency of the shuttle service. And this is also reflected on the users and the system uh, in the sub for the subway system and bus rider system. Um, and here agencies really can use um, this type of tool for post incident analysis and evaluate how good their plans are and how can they improve their plans for future uh, and future cases and future implant instructions. Um, and here there's really the list of some of the publications on this work, including some sensitivity analysis on the tool itself and the optimization. And these are also found on the ICD website. Um, before I hold, I hold to uh, Fumbi, um, this was the initial visualization dashboard that was developed in collaboration with Trapeze for our assessment tool. Um, but thanks to Ocadio, um, they have much better uh, in informative visualization. And I'm leave it here for all of them being. Uh, thank you, Ala. Uh, so basically, this, visualiz this visualization dashboard is uh, basically what it is, uh, what it says it is. It helps, uh, it's going to help us uh, simulate several scenarios simultaneously. We're looking for this dashboard to be able to uh, graphically display uh, scaled passenger counts. Uh, so and these scenarios can be uh, assessed side by side. Uh, so you can be able to look at the, the map itself and the data. Uh, we also want this, uh, we also wanted this prototype to be able to display the delay times for arriving passengers at affected stations. And we want this uh, dashboard to also provide a complete overview of the system, uh, possess interactive uh, data visualizations and distinct uh, visualizations of each uh, trend or data set on the map or element. And we were looking for the potential, uh, long-term potential of real-time vehicle tracking of GTFS data. Okay. So the first iteration was created using uh, Adobe's, it was created after consulting with Amr's group and Alla, Amr and Alla uh, initially. Uh, we basically, uh, and my research partners, the first idea was to create an interface tool that showed the steps required to actually bridge buses. And so this is what we came up with using uh, Adobe's uh, creative suite, suite of software. We tried incorporating, I tried incorporating a live map that reacts to the input, reacts to the input on the go. And I attempted to redesign the, uh, visual, the tool uh, house group had, and basically try to create a step-by-step -step, uh, input so after creating this, our assessment on meeting with uh, the o uh, University of Toronto's team was that the map didn't display, uh, didn't display unique graphics enough. It lacked any comparative, comparative statistical data. Uh, we needed it to be able to compare two scenarios at the same time, and we needed it to display the surrounding uh, buses in the contextual area. We also wanted to increase the levels of interactivity of the tool and we needed the tool to help support decision making and improve map readability. So we created this, this, this is the second iteration of the tool in where I begin to, uh, I began to play around with Esri's operations dashboards. Uh, I was new to it at the time, but I spent time uh, trying to learn, get myself accustomed to the workflow because I already used the RGIS uh, desktop and pro and online. So basically this uh, we cr ex created by exploring uh, ways to handle geospatial data and statistics fluidly on a single uh, map. And basically what we have here is that the circles on each station help, uh, we're supposed to uh, be a scale of how many people were at each disruption. Uh, we have the pie chart that helps display the number of TTC vehicles currently available within a given radius, usually between 500 meters to one kilometer. Uh, we wanted, so from this, we wanted, uh, we wanted this to be able to uh, hold GTFS data and represent it visually on the map. Uh, next one. So some of the assessments we got from this, uh, once again, meeting with the team at, Uf, at, the team at UFT, was that we needed to provide uh, an overview of the entire scenario. We needed it to 
display the total user delay for each scenario. Uh, we needed an increase in meaningful data displayed. We wanted to be able to, like I mentioned earlier, increase the interactivity of the dashboard. This had some interactivity in when you selected elements on the map, like the bus routes, uh, the graphs surrounding it would, uh, would be changed and altered. So you could look at specific bus routes or just two uh, stations at a time. So we also wanted this uh, model. This <clears throat> we also wanted this view to be able to hold two maps at the same time, so we could simultaneously, like I said, uh, assess two situations. And we wanted this to we wanted this map uh, to have more uh, dialog boxes and tooltips when hovered, so people didn't people could easily read the map without having to do much. Uh, we could go to the next one. So this is the final and third iteration basically uh, permits the side-by-side -side comparison of two scenarios at the same time. Uh, the in interface is much more interactive and has way more, uh, <clears throat> has way much more statistical data present. Uh, all the bus routes are uniquely colored and identifiable uh, by several more uh, attributes when selected or hovered over. Uh, go to the next one. Uh, also, so this is another view of the dashboard and where we're looking at several. So the dashboard, like I said, has several uh, components to it. If you saw, if you, if you can see at the bottom, it has the number of buses pulled, out of service duration, bus riders delayed, deadhead time. And then we have a comparison of out of service against the bus riders delay and the bus riders delay. So it's, it would be really, uh, the map would be really clustered if we had all these layers on at the same time. So in, in order for there to be more insightful uh, like assessment or decision-making made, we allow whoever is using this tool to be able to look at each layer of information individually and compare it to the second or their alternative scenario side by side. So this is what this graph here is showing the total bus riders delay in passenger minutes. And what it does here is that each passenger, the total, delay here is is for all the amount of riders at us at any given station or at any bus route within a given scenario and then these are basically graphically scaled uh bus routes that show you uh the amount of de delays and where the delays are occurring across the entire system uh moving on we're looking at the out of service duration uh visualizations. And this basically displays the amount of time uh, buses spend out of service. Uh, Alan mentioned that before. This is when they're called from the from their regular schedules and they're called to help aid uh, a disrupted segment. And then this also this view also permits uh, for the graphs to be displayed side by side with the map. And uh, some of the challenges using this was that there isn't the link between the desktop version of ArcGIS and the dashboards is using online, but then using a th using that on using ArcGIS online prevents a fluid like a fluid flow of information. So if I wanted to change something, I'd have to go back to desktop to change something, then upload it to online, then upload it to the dashboards. Uh, but other than that, uh, I feel like dashboards uh, the potential for ArcGIS dashboards to support this visualization tool would be highly uh, successful. Uh, I'm going to hand over back to Alan now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fumbi. Um, I just would like to finish by acknowledging uh, our partners uh, for the entire research fund and our major industry partners, Trapeze, um, and other funds from NSERC, um, OCE, and Saucer. And I will ask uh, Professor Amr Shalabi from the University of Toronto to join us for the Q&A session. Great. Yes, welcome, Amr. Uh, Amr Shalaby, Professor Amr Shalaby from the University of Toronto, uh, was the ICD researcher on transit in our project, and he's joining the Q&A. Um, thank you very much, Alat and uh, Fumbi, for taking us through the progression of that research through the development of your fundamental algorithms for doing this, and then the, you know, the thought process that took you through to create the visualizations that you did, because I think that was really interesting. Um, so transit is so much in the news these days, and we realize that it's, uh, it's essential to so many people trying to get around in the city. 
um, and we've all experienced subway disruptions of a kind. Um, how do people experience the disruptions to bus service and, and who dis experiences these disruptions to bus service? So usually like the people who use transit system is really um, the lower kind of class people, um, especially that we found, if, I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken of, uh, of your question of who really is more affected. Um, I think an American also mentioned more about this, that we found that we really, in the actual scenarios that the DC has followed, these bus routes were really selected from lower socioeconomic um, demographic um, areas. Um, which really here pose an equity, social equity kind of uh, question mark um, on selection of these shuttle buses, um, additional layer to consider by transit agencies. Well, I guess uh, you yeah. can't draw a streetcar, can you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Can, <laughs> yeah, can follow up on Ala's uh, comment. Yeah, she's absolutely right. We've actually done some follow up work on uh, looking at the uh, equity. Um, implications of bus bridging practices. And uh, while generally speaking, I think we haven't seen major differences in terms of where those buses are being drawn from, uh, but there is some disparities uh, in terms of the capacity loss for people who live in uh, sort of lower income and carless uh, neighborhoods. So more buses are disproportionately being pulled from those buses, from those routes or those areas. Uh, to serve as shuttle service when uh, subway is um, is experiencing some closure, so there is an an equity issue that really needs to be addressed in the future. Especially the fact that also we found that ride hailing uh, becomes a less really affordable option for lower income and carless people in the event when there is a subway closure. So um, people who live in um, in such neighborhoods are actually hit twice, number one, by reduced bus route uh, capacity and twice by, you know, the lower availability of ride hailing options and being more expensive uh, at times of subway disruption. And I guess alternatives generally. Yeah. Right. Just, uh, I mean, it's not certainly not that uh, anybody is, um, anybody is purpose purposely trying to inflict additional pain on anybody yeah. who relies on transit. But these are, um, there are there are areas of the city that are simply served by buses, yeah. and yeah. perhaps a lot of buses to sat to satisfy the great demand out there for getting around. Yeah. And if you see, uh, if you have to make an emergency decision about uh, filling in for a subway that's down and and yeah. evac getting people out of downtown, and we got to move a lot of people out out of the down on a normal day, we have to move a lot yeah. of people out of downtown. And the you look somewhere and see a lot of buses, and they may look like that's the capacity you can tap. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, typically the, the high priority candidate routes for pulling buses from during subway uh, closure are ones really that the so-called priority routes, ones that really serve uh, in the neighborhood uh, improvement areas and uh, a higher proportion of people without uh, cars and also lower income people. So those are usually the candidate routes or higher candidate routes from which buses have been pulled. So obviously there's a, an equity impact here. Maybe you can get the, the data that Michael Leahy showed in the last, yeah. uh, last presentation of the differential in, uh, uh, in travel modes choices, the differentials in cost and time and, uh, and, and add that into the analysis for how people, how people are differently impacted by this. Oh yeah, wow, well, uh, having similar thoughts as, as <laughs> presentation, I think there's a lot of uh, synergy and uh, we can benefit really from the tools that were developed in the other project. Um, and so again, just because transit so much top of mind and, and we've realized what an essential service that it is, um, you know, sometimes it's vulnerable and it just shows that we need enough of it to keep everybody safe and keep people moving. So back, back thinking about the safe side in these present times, you know, so things have changed. Things have changed. Our our capacities have changed, our services have changed, uh, the cost to the TTC has changed, or, and other transit systems all across, you know, everywhere. Um, in our new, in our, in this, these days of 100 days of COVID and, 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 and maybe afterwards, how can you see this tool being used the, the same or differently? Yeah, so 
really a key, uh, in a recent webinar by the UITP, they mentioned that a key challenge that's facing transit agencies now is really to manage overcrowding and manage flows, as you mentioned, with the safety issues and social distancing. And we know that the capacity is, is now reduced. But um, as, as a mean for this, we can see a potential to use shuttle buses, not only uh, for bridging the disrupted stations, but also to help in moving people in turn, to relief overcrowding on the subway system, um, instead of freely over having overcrowding on the subway. Um, we also see this tool as, for example, how could bus bridging look like in the post-COVID world with social distancing measures and this reduced capacity of buses? Is it enough? Uh, do we need other implications? Do we need other tools? How many buses will be needed? And this tool really can help agencies assess these different scenarios and these different cases. And, and, I, think, and uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Um, as, as we, you know, re our new language, as we reopen, as people get back to work, as people get back to their lives, and we know now how many people essentially, you know, people we consider to be essential workers who keep yeah. us going every day, rely on transit. Absolutely. And then there's the rest of us, right, who, who rely on it as well to get around for some of the, the things we like to do in the great city that's coming back to us someday. I'm gonna thank you very much. Uh, we're coming to a close here. Uh, thank everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's presentations. Um, and I want to remind you again that all of this great iCity work is available on our website. The content there will continue to grow and we encourage you to check back often for more news about iCity. I think you agree that the true value of our, our multidisciplinary academic government industry collaboration was really uh, apparent in today's talks. Uh, I want to thank you for attending. I want to encourage you to join us for the next ICD presentations and, uh, and say that it's been a pleasure to have you and, we're, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.